the computer. Hi, my name is Renee Hobbs. Uh, my God, it's today is, can you believe it? It's October 24th, 2017. I'm here with the amazing students of COM 416 Propaganda. Um, we have a lot to do and only one hour, and so uh, let's, let's get started. Uh, who do I see here is joining me? Of course, only the best students in the entire class. I see, I see Kelly, I see Candace. I see Eric. Uh, so um, we're feeling sorry for you losers who are having to watch this like as a YouTube video because it's not nearly as much fun that way, but you know, that's what you got to do that you got to do. Um, okay, so hold on. I can't even share my screen with you because I don't have my screen. Oh, yes, I do have my screen on. Hold on just a sec. Um, today our... Um, our topic is really how did Hitler rise to power using his skillful propaganda skills? Um, because that's what we read, uh, we read about this week in the amazing giant coffee table book, The Power of Nazi Propaganda. But before we get to that, how did Hitler almost get elected using propaganda? Um, Let's talk a little bit about the, the next big assignment, Leap 3, uh, because I really uh, want to make sure you're making good progress on that. And I suspect, based on some evidence that I've seen in the last day or two, that there might be some confusion. And so I want to uh, clear that up. Um, maybe we should start by talking about, did you guys encounter any propaganda in the news this week or on your social media feed or on your Instagram? Did you encounter any propaganda this week? If I'm being honest, I, I haven't really been watching the news and I haven't been on social media this week. It's just been crazy. So I've been doing all schoolwork nonstop, essentially. So I have no social life right now, so I couldn't even tell you what's going on. All right, here you go. Hopefully no propaganda in schoolwork, but uh, notice. Kelly, have you encountered any propaganda this week? Um, I'm sure I've seen, like, at, like, celebrity endorsements and, like, my social media ads and stuff, but I haven't really been watching too much news. I don't have the time to watch the TV lately. Got it. And you, Eric, have you encountered any propaganda this last week? Uh, I'm kind of in the same boat. I've just been like busy with schoolwork that I haven't watched TV, the news, anything at all. I haven't even checked <laughs> Twitter in days. Oh my God. All right, well, so I, um, I of course, I get, pa I get paid to watch TV. Just saying, that's what media studies professors, you know, do, you know. I even deduct my cable bill from my taxes, okay? Because it's a job expense. Uh, so, of course, uh, having given that I'm paid to watch television for a living and to use media and read the New York Times, one of the things I've been paying attention to is, um, you know, Chinese people, uh, they, don't, they don't vote because China's not a democracy, right? It, it's, a, it's a communist part. It's a communist government, although with a capitalist orientation. And, um, but every five years, the communist party has a kind of, um, a kind of election where if you're in the communist party, it's like a pyramid scheme. You know, the people on the bottom elect like the next people up and then the people up there. And then it's kind of like a pyramid scheme. And of course, they re-elected President Xi Jinping. And they did an enormous amount of prop positive propaganda, right, about how far China has come in such a long period, in, you know, in, in just the last five years. And What's fascinating about that is, depending on your point of view, that could be seen as positive propaganda, making Chinese people feel good about their government. Um, on the other hand, um, China has just um, uh, revealed that over the next five years, they're going to be creating a, um, a social media good citizen metric that will affect what kind of jobs you get, uh, what kind of um, credit card you get and what kind of, you know, jobs you get and what kind of future you have. And that um, school, you, every, every citizen of China is going to get a score based on things, obvious things like, um, did you pay your credit card? 
or did you pay your water bill, right? Um, but also, were your social media communications positive and uplifting? Because you'll get a higher score than if you're a cranky critic, always complaining. So it's really interesting that because now everything we do is subject to be part of big data, the government in China is going to be using that data to rate people. And I just, mind blown, right? That scares the crap out of me. So I've been debating about how I understand that as a very negative, dangerous thing. But I'm also aware that I might be getting propaganda that's kind of Western that depicts that phenomenon from a particular point of view, right? Which is, uh, so anyway, I'm trying to sort out what's the truth about this new set of new technologies that the Chinese government's going to be using to, mm, I don't know, to, mm, is it is it to spy on people or is it to force people into compliance with a certain ideology? Is it to suppress dissent? Or is it just to teach people what it means to be a good citizen? All of those things could be true. So propaganda is definitely in the news uh, these days on lots of topics, but that one really caught my eye, partly out of a part of fear. Um, okay, so next item on the agenda, learn, uh, learn more about the history of propaganda and leap three. These two topics go together because your leap three involves two big ideas. First, you have to collaborate with a partner. And second of all, you have to compare and contrast a, a contemporary example something that's happening in 2016 or 2017, that's what contemporary means, right? Happening now, to something that happened in the past. Now, um, what's really cool about that is that you have a lot, you and your partner have a lot of creative freedom, right? And one thing it might have you do is it have, might have you thinking more about the past. And so partly before I even talk about Leap 3, I wanted to orient you to a resource we're only just now starting on the past, and we're only going to look at a slender part of the past. We're looking at Nazi propaganda, right? But you might find it useful to review the history of propaganda by going to the Museum of Public Relations. Raise your hand if you've ever been here before. The Museum of Public Relations. Such a cool thing. Sponsored by Hofstra University. It's a... Basically, it's a slideshow, and it says propaganda goes back to the time of the cave people, ha! which I would disagree with based on my definition of propaganda. I think propaganda was not going on during these, these time periods, but that depends on your point of view, right? Anyway, they go all the way through to um, the contemporary uh, times, and this might just inspire your thinking in fresh ways about comparing the present to the past, right? So as you think about that idea of comparison contrast, um, you know, you might consider, oh, here's a guy, our, 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 our Connecticut friend, P.T. Barnum, right? If you've ever been to um, Bridgeport, Connecticut, you might have visited the P.T. Barnum Museum. This guy was the original huckster. He sold everything. He sold people. He sold freak shows. He was an amazing figure in the history of propaganda and propaganda as entertainment, right? So it's just a really interesting uh, website with uh, really uh, kind of ideas to inspire you. There's our friend Eddie Bernays, right? Um, and it goes kind of all the way up um, into the present. And um, you might find um, a part of history by, by scrolling on this website that makes you think about making a comparison between past, present, and future. So I invite you to take a look at that. Um, okay, so back to leap, um, back to leap three. Um, the first step that I hope uh, I hope you have done or, or, or have will be completing by today is you must identify a partner. So I can see from the Google Doc that it looks like some partnerships have formed already. Um, 
And I think Kelly, did I see did I see that you have formed a partnership with Jenna Z, right? And Candice, you've formed a partnership with Connor. Fantastic, right? Um, so Eric, I'm hoping that you're going to choose a partner. Some people are putting their suggestions up here. So Kristen Beatty is interested in looking at what wants a partner who's interested in political propaganda. Uh, Alex is interested in somebody who's interested in propaganda with Hollywood and movies. Uh, Colton is interested in people who might be interested in propaganda around the tobacco industry or sports propaganda. And I've taken the liberty of putting people's emails here at the bottom because in the next um, really one or two days, you should find your partner. So um, that's a really important part of the, working collaboratively is a really important part of the LEAP3. Okay, um, I did invite you to take a look at this really beautiful, it's, a, it's just a five minute, it's a five minute um, podcast on why working with a partner ignites more creativity than working solo. That's the point of why I'm asking you to work collaboratively anyway, because I want your work to be really strong creatively. So do listen to this podcast when it comes to creativity, are two heads better than one? Let's take a listen. The writer Joshua Wolfshank has it in for what he calls the myth of the lone genius. In his new book, Shank argues that creativity, far from being the product of solitary inspiration, is more commonly the result of two people interacting in a variety Aha! Creativity comes from two people interacting. Yeah, baby. That seems true to me. That's partly why finding a partner now and starting to brainstorm is a good thing. Um, now, to do that, I have, I'm welcoming you to use a really cool tool for collaboration called Slack. Slack is commonly used in the workplace and used in all, com all the communication professions and in many other walks of life as well. It's, it's a messaging tool, a project management tool, and it's really fun to use. And if you use Slack for this class, you will be able to put on your resume. Yes, you are good at Word. And yes, you have learned Picto Chart. And yes, you have learned Padlet. And you are an expert at Screencast. Because <laughs> you just, your leap two, you just made one. And you'll be able to say, and I know Slack. And that's going to put you far ahead of other graduates who aren't getting a digitally an experience with digital literacy. Um, so hopefully you've received my invitation uh, to Slack and maybe even experimented at the Slack Media Education Lab. So if you go back to the home page, you're going, going to see that you can click on the invitation link. If you haven't, if you haven't um, joined Slack uh, and you want to try it out, um, you can hit, just use that join code and you get sort of automatically entered into this, uh, into this community. Um, and what's cool about this community, oh, and, the, and I, why, why is this community taking so long to uh, load? That's a very peculiar thing, look here. Okay, very nice, is that leap three questions. So the way it's organized, it's just a messaging app, right? But it allows you to embed documents, video, to share resources. So. For instance, um, let's see, Kelly. Uh, Kelly, I'm going to message you and say, uh, uh, you, whoops, here, let me see if I can type properly. You picked a great partner, right? You picked a great partner. And I hit the return key, and it basically al allows me to have a private chat with Kelly. It also allows me to easily upload documents. I hit the plus sign and I can add documents from Google Drive, from Google Docs, my computer, basically anywhere. And what's cool about that is that part of how you and your partner figure out what you're gonna say is by looking at stuff together and talking about it. That's the essence of creativity. So um, you could, for example, start your own channel create a new channel, you, you have all the power to do that, and you could create a new power, you know, you could call yourself, you know, the A-team. I'm gonna just start a new, new group called the A-team. You, you start the A-team, you invite your partner to the A-team, and now you and your partner have a private discussion thread. 
Only you and your partner can see that discussion thread, but it allows you to store all your materials and documents on there. Um, you can see that I've, I, in my workplace, I'm working on projects that have uh, similar kinds of people involved in conversation, right? So we're working on a project right now and we're sharing documents and having conversations about it, right? And that's how we're getting the project done. So let's just see if you guys have any questions about the collaboration part of LEAP3. What questions do you have about the, oh, about the collaboration part of, um, of LEAP3? Hey, Wei Min, I see you joined us. Welcome, welcome. We're just talking about LEAP3, which is due in just 14 days or two weeks. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit about this idea of comparing and cr contrasting, right? Um, in this case, I wanna provide a, an appropriate level of scaffolding for you to compare and contrast. Uh, if you go to this website, which is loading really slowly, from Worcester, Worcester, oh no, from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, it's going to describe comparing and contrasting in terms of writing an academic paper. First you, describe, first you talk about the first artifact, then you talk about the other artifact, then you engage in the comparison contrast. So that's a familiar format for you, but um, that... Uh, article gives good scaffolding about how to um, engage in a process of comparison contrast to write an academic paper. Um, the most important additional part of this, besides writing an eight to twelve collab, uh, eight to twelve page paper collaboratively, right, uh, with a title page, an abstract, and a works cited page, right, which you submit as a Google Doc because I'll be making comments on the side, right? Is that you're going to be making a picto chart and that's really an infographic. And I'm really happy to provide you with a chapter from my new book called Create to Learn. And this chapter is about how to make an infographic. And it's a 10 page chapter, it's pretty easy to read. And it has a great uh, set of advice on what is an infographic and how do you use visuals to communicate and how do you use visuals to compare and contrast right um so check out this section controlling attention with comparison contrast it gives a kind of a really cool um it, you have to imagine you're turning the book on the side now or turning your computer on the side now i'm turning my computer on the side right um this map is a ratio of bars to restaurants uh, to grocery stores bars to grocery stores in the united states right so uh the mm, the um infographic writer found a really creative way to capture my attention and look at how uh, in Wisconsin there are more bars than grocery stores. Ah, who knew, right? Um, but please do um, take a look at the how to make an infographic in five easy steps, right? Um, because this five-step process will, um, will help you tremendously, I think, in being efficient in your use of creating the infographic. Um, okay, so, um, you can see from the criteria for evaluation that um, your content has to be strong. So the choice of artifact, you know, you're gonna use one artifact from the past, one artifact from the present, and then you're gonna compare and contrast. Your analysis of those two artifacts and of the similarities and differences between them has to be strong. But at the same time, you have to be able to communicate using images and design principles when you create your infographic to express your ideas. Now, a lot of my students have told me, Renee, you know what? We, our team, we started on the infographic first, and then we wrote the academic paper. Almost like we used the infographic to discover the main ideas that we wanted to develop. And then once we had that, then writing the paper was relatively easy. Who knew, right? So I think that's a depends on what kind of 
person you are, what kind of learner you are, but that can be very effective, right? But realize that both of them, the infographic and the academic paper, are due in 21 days. Uh, okay, so let's see what questions you have before I go any further. And just think about this, you guys are asking questions on behalf of the entire class. Okay, so it doesn't look like you have questions, so I'm not gonna torture you. Um, but I think this is a fun activity. I have given you a bunch of examples of other student work to look at, and I think you'll probably find that to be useful and inspiring as well. Okay, so, um, all right, now it's time for, I think, for us to talk about um, uh, talk about the, the reading. I think one of the, um, one of the most interesting questions that we have here is in this chapter, uh, chapter one, in our State of Deception book. What forms of propaganda and concepts of effective communication did Hitler use in order to advance the goals of the Nazi party? Um, so let's start by looking at some of the answers that uh, students gave when they looked, when they shared ideas on the path right, and then we'll fill in some of the gaps. So I was really pleased to see um, some very strong answers uh, in this uh, section of the, um, of the path right. So I'm going to the section called Propaganda and for Votes and Power. We'll learn how politicians use propaganda to get elected and how some of the strat strategies used by the Nazis persist as essential components of the political process today. So um, right here at this section of the, of the, uh, of the path right, um, many of you put some great, some great examples, right? Um, and so I am just going to identify the ones that I upvoted. I gave um, uh, everybody, until, uh, unless they uh, submitted just in the last hour or two, I gave uh, feedback uh, to you. So you might have already received a little email from me. Um, Adriana talks a lot about this idea that um, Hitler's formation of the Nazi party really drew upon his ability um, to um, create catchy advertising, right? And she talks a little bit about the design of the swastika, which Hitler personally supervised, right? Um, and the way in which color was important there. Um, so Rachel Steele uh, used a really great example from the book about Hitler as a public speaker and the power of his performance as a form of propaganda. So she uses an image from the book which shows still images of Hitler's oratory um, and we we definitely understand how sensitive he was to the performance it was like almost like an actor would be in terms of playing a role um, so for instance one thing that um, Rachel points out is that um, she says from oratory poses to tone to volume and the music played when he entered and exited the stage in the book it says that um, he would never ever stay on the stage after he was done with a speech. When he was finished with a speech, the music started and off he went backstage. He never ever stayed on stage after the speech was over. He thought that was ruined the emotional uh, tone. So that idea of creating a larger than life persona, he was really uh, strong. And I, I commented uh, uh, to Rachel on that. Um, Jenna Z's uh, really great use of um, this chapter was really about the, um, the radio, right? Uh, and the um, way in which, um, you know, sort of um, radio was a brand new technology and there was definitely a lot of um, excitement and she says paranoia about it right? Because it was such an unknown new technology, right? Um, and um, and um, 
one of the things that, uh, Candace, that you talked about um, was this idea of um, propaganda really uh, focusing on um, thought leaders. The four minute men were these um, trusted community leaders who during World War I went into a community and gave four minute speeches in churches, in um, schools, in community centers, at men's clubs, at ladies clubs, at luncheon, at the bowling alley, and really capitalizing on what Bernays said was uh, important about propaganda, that thought leaders, you know, they tell us what we should think is important. Um, so I was really, really happy uh, to see that example. So I think one thing that I noticed that um, most of you did not put in the path right, that I think is a really important idea for making sense of propaganda in, um, in the rise up to World War II, and hold on here, I'm just trying to figure out how to get back to my website here. One of the things that nobody has really yet on the thread talked about um, is a concept that's so, that we so take for granted that we just can't imagine that it was ever a new idea. And so that's what I want to talk about a little bit now. Um, so it's responding to this question. Boy, my computer is so slow today. Sorry about that. It's responding to this question, what forms of propaganda and concepts of effective communication did Hitler use in order to advance the goals of the Nazi party? So I'm gonna tell you the answer, and then I want you to see if you can explain to me that what you know about how he used this particular technique. Adolf Hitler was brilliant at exploiting the concept of target audience. And he delivered different messages to different target audiences in his bid to become the chancellor, the, the president of Germany. What do you remember from your reading or learn from your life about how Hitler exploited the concept of target audience as he sought to become the president of Germany? Well, I know in um, the movie we watched, even though it was kind of like a farce, you can tell he was doing the same thing because when they traveled across the country, he would ask each person, he would be like, what are you like, what are you specifically unhappy with? And he, I mean, they, they wrote about it in the book too, but they wrote about how he would use what he was learning from these people. And that's how he would talk. So like, it makes sense that like, that was his, you know, target method because he, acted as if he was interested he he was like um uh what's the word like a sociopath like he was so smart he knew everything he was doing he like made a point to kind of make a connection with you and make you feel for what he was saying it's like crazy to learn about i i really appreciate how you use the example from the film because we do see him going out and asking people what their concerns are and then linking it linking their concerns to his political goals Good start. So how did, how did Hitler use the concept of target audience? To get elected or to almost get elected. Um, when he was like anti-Semitism, it was like um, central to like the Nazi party, but he would like downplay it or even like leave it out depending who he was talking to. Yeah, some people never heard the anti-Semitic part of his message. Other people learned all about that, that the Jews were the enemy and the Bolsheviks were the enemy. That's exactly right, but other people, he downplayed that message. Great job, Kelly. What else? How did Hitler exploit the concept of target audience as he sought to become the president of Germany? I think that he just, like, 
he would, they would talk to different groups. Like as we said, like he would downplay certain aspects and stuff. He just he was just honestly really good at communicating with the public, and he was really good at promoting himself. And like in the video, as we mentioned earlier, I think all I think these two things that we already mentioned are really like his biggest strengths. He would go out there and he'd find out what the people actually didn't like and what they wanted change for. Then he would use that and fit that into his like his whole play his whole his whole campaign and then he would use it and he would know what like when talking to certain people what to say and what not to say and he was just very keen on the audience he was very keen on targeting specific audiences and specific people and their likes and their dislikes and how much he could get away with something it, you know it's a really good point eric because back in the day he didn't have pollsters feeding him uh data about public opinion, right? That this this time period, there there were no such technologies of polling, right? So he had to go to an event and pay attention to what the crowd responded to. Did they cheer a lot when he said blah, 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 or were they silent, right? So he was really paying attention to how the audience responded right, to his messages, right? And like you said, he went around to different audiences, you know, you start to see some patterns, right? What people in the South respond to, what people in the North respond to. So he's not relying on public opinion polls to tell him what Germans think. He's like paying attention to the audience clues about what to think. And he's, and he's going out. He's going out on the um, you know street. Here he is. You know the little girl is kind of like trailing behind him. He's going out and talking to people, just like the film uh, "Look Who's Back" suggested. And of course, what I like is the idea that he uses different kind of messages to different audiences. You know, so this one says we're going to beat the crap out of uh, the Bolsheviks, right? And so this is definitely targeting males, right? <laughs> Because it's it's like, you know, it's a fuck you poster, right? And that's that feels good, right? Stick it to the man, right? But like, look at this one. This one is like, we're we're smarter and better than those other Europeans, right? Like we're smart. This makes plays on feeling superior, feelings of superiority, right? And this one is definitely targeting workers, right? And then he targeted mothers. Aw, aw, right? Um, and he targeted old guys, war veterans, right? The ones who really got screwed by World War I. Students, he had special messages just for students. Right now, today we sort of like go, we go like, oh, um, yeah, of course he targeted messages to target audiences. But that was a radical and brand new concept in 1930, 1931, 1932, right? So that idea uh, is a really important um, contribution that Hitler made to propaganda. Um, and in some ways, that invites us to like talk about the next question, right? So this idea of targeting audiences, um, the screen share says the second question is, why is that so effective? So there's the question, Eric, Kelly, Candace. Tar targeting target audiences, like, why is that effective? Um, I guess I'll start. Okay, so targeting um, like a specific group of people becomes effective because you're making your message tailored in a sense. It's kind of like when you buy, you know, like a run. It's like the difference between buying like a run the mill suit. It's not going to fit you perfectly, opposed to getting it like perfectly tailored. Like every inch, every crevice is for you. So. He is making these people feel special and as if he really cares about each individual as a person opposed to as a group, which is what he, you know, 
is really trying to get the message across to. But um, it was effective because these people felt special and they felt like this one man is, you know, looking out for each of them as individuals and not just as another face in the crowd. And that was something really big for them after, um, you know, after everything, after World War One, essentially. Love, love that comment. Two big ideas presented with great concision and clarity. I love the metaphor of tailoring and even how you developed it, that that was very cool. And then I do think, so you're talking kind of like about the socio-emotional aspects of like what it felt like to have this big important guy deliver a message that felt like was speaking to you, that that actually had, it made people feel empowered or special or made people feel close to him. Any other reasons why the exploiting the concept of target audience was so effective for Hitler? He didn't win the election, but he came in second. Why was it such an effective technique? Besides the two reasons that Candace gave. Okay, so based on our uh, reading about propaganda, we know that propaganda, um, well, let's just go to the Mind Over Media website, right? We know that propaganda's um, general approach, right? Let me just click on that, is to activate strong emotions, simplify information and ideas, respond to audience needs and values, and attack opponents. So let's talk about simplifying information and ideas. One thing that um, one thing that a tar having a target audience does is mean that there's a whole lot of things you don't have to talk about, right? You know. So what's relevant to students? Well, there's the issue of uh, jobs, and there's the issue of uh, cost of education. Uh, and then there's some social issues like can you love who you want to love and can you, you know, be free from your parents' influence? And that's really all that students care about, right? Don't talk to them about uh, buying a house or social security or health care. They don't give a shit about that, right? So target audience, focusing on target audiences really helps you when you're trying to simplify ideas, right? Now, how does the concept of target audience help you with the propaganda strategy of attacking opponents? How did Hitler use this strategy differentially in his political campaign? Um, I guess I'll go. Uh, so essentially what he did was he understood that people are more inclined to come together when there's a common enemy. And essentially, um, he made that common enemy anybody. I mean, after the World War One, Germany was very poor. So he made the common enemy, um, well, one of them, the Jews, because um, stereotypically, they are well off, they have money, they had businesses, and they were thriving. And he didn't think that was fair to the German people. So he kind of made them, um, as a group of people, someone that the, you know, traditional German should hate. Right. So that us versus them polarization um, was a, a, a strategic choice that allowed him to um, capture a wide audience of people who felt really diminished and wounded by the outcome of World War I, the unfairness of the Treaty of Versailles, which really was not fair to Germany at all, um, and then to pin the anger and the resentment on a common enemy. Nice. Okay, so what's so fascinating is about the first chapter of this book is how it helps us understand that Hitler started off as a politician. He became a dictator. We're gonna, that's what we're gonna learn about next week, right? He started off as a politician in a democracy, campaigning to get elected like every other politician, using techniques used by every other politician, right? Next week, we're gonna learn 
how he created the uh, um, the Jews as a enemy that needed to be exterminated, right? How he created uh, the attitudes that enabled uh, the gas chambers um, to function and, and created the systems of exclusion that excluded Jews from being part of German society. Now, I wanted to... Um, so I wanted to take a few minutes to, to invite you to take a look at what you're going to be looking at next week. Um, but first, let's go to the um, let's go to the Twitter because you guys have been, in fact, using the Twitter um, really uh, terrifically um, to um, share your learning with each other in this class. Uh, and so, Candace, there you are, right at the top, girl. Waha, woohoo! So you're giving feedback to other students. Um, uh, I like Eric's um, example of um, name calling, uh, looking at the Wendy's McDonald's mm -hmm. controversy. Um, uh, Justine, looking at the um, the iPhone as uh, the popularity of the iPhone as kind of a bandwagon effect. Um, and so it looks to me like you are actually um, finding examples of contemporary propaganda, making connections to the readings. Um, and really thinking about um, how the ideas that we're reading about are applying in our, you know, in our everyday life. Um, now, I'm also really happy with, in general, the quality of your participation on the path right. Really, that's where all the learning happens because you learning is an active process. So you can't really learn in this class unless you do these activities. And of course. Um, it's really easy for me to track that. You can see from my end of the path, right? I'm, it's pretty obvious to me who's doing the work, who's not doing the work. But I did want to give a special call out um, to some really extraordinary work that is happening on these sites. Um, so I asked you to read this really interesting article called How Politicians Should and Shouldn't Use Twitter Bots, right? And you guys had a great time uh, answering this, I really appreciate how each of you followed a hyperlink from that article to learn more. And people made some similar choices and some different choices. Um, but my shout out for this week goes to Connor Fogelstrom, whose answer is like textbook perfect. So much so that I gave him way more points than four points for this answer because it was so friggin' good. Let's take a look at it. And then you might be able to tell me why it's so good and it deserves the prize for this week. So I just finished up reading. Uh, now, can you guys see him and hear him when I'm playing it? Thumbs up if you can. Okay, good. Let's article, listen. How so I just finished up reading uh, the article, How Politicians Should and Shouldn't Use Twitter Bots. Um, as I was going through the article, one of the hyperlinks, hyperlinks that interests me uh, was for a term called AstroTurf. AstroTurf. Which I found interesting, so I clicked on it, and it brought me to a site called politicaldictionary.com, and it gave a definition for AstroTurfing, which means an artificially manufactured political movement designed to give the appearance of grassroots activism. And I found this interesting because it was kind of a, a play on words of the grassroots activism because it is artificially manufactured, just like AstroTurf is. So I found that to be interesting. Um, the website also um, goes on to say um, that unlike natural grassroots campaigns, which are people rich and money poor, AstroTurf campaign tends to be the opposite because it's well funded with little actual support from voters, which I found interesting because even though there's a lot of money involved in it, the support from people isn't good because it's solely um, online and artificially manufactured. Okay, so, um, oh, there's so many reasons why I love that example, right? Um, one thing that Connor does in this, um, in this uh, Flipgrid is he clearly explains what he's responding to, right? He tells us about the original piece and then he tells us about the link that he went to. 
He defines the concept of astroturfing really carefully. Um, and he um, offers a, um, a, a pretty crisp uh, definition and example of it. Um, so I, I saw lots of evidence in the flip grids that you were um, both having fun and learning, right? And so I was really, really, really pleased uh, with the um, a variety of ways you answered this question and the extent to which you found uh, that particular article to be a really good learning experience. Okay, so now I just have 10 minutes, so I wanna talk to you about what you should be doing. You can see that this week, uh, relatively speaking, you're deep into leap three. So I'm giving you time to do leap three because leap three is the major thing, you know, you're supposed to be doing this week. Um, but let me go to what we're going to be reading and learning for week uh, nine, um, because that's what I'd like you to complete for next week, which is, oh, can you believe it? It's next uh, Tuesday. It's, um, yikes, it's, it's Halloween. Yeesh. So. Uh, just three, th just three activities. Um, you're going to read the second big chapter in State of Deception, pages 63 to 100. We're going to do just the same thing we did before. Explain and analyze something interesting that you learned as you read the chapter. Be sure to include both a careful description of what you learned as well as your reaction to it. Then insert an image that illustrates or extends the meaning of your post. Please read all the answers in the queue before you write your own post so that you avoid duplicating or repeating ideas and information. And so since we looked at that earlier in class, the procedure is the same. It should be really familiar to you. Um, okay, so now the second thing that we're gonna do is, I, I'm so upset about this. You know, last year, I could have my students watch the entire Forbidden Films documentary, which is just an hour long documentary, but it's awesome. Because after World War II, as part of the denazification process, um, there were 1200 Nazi films made during the Nazi period, uh, but 70 of them were considered to be so good that they were put in a vault and it's illegal to watch them in Germany. And this documentary shows you examples of these forbidden films that are so good, these propaganda films that are so good that they can't be sh seen legally in Germany. And it asks the question, should Nazi propaganda films be released from the vault and made available to the German public? Why or why not? Last year, Forbidden Films was available on iTunes for like $1.99. Ah! But this year, it's not. And it's moved to another platform and it costs like $150. <laughs> so you just get to watch the two minute trailer, but read the great short article in the New York Times. So after reading the article in the New York Times and watching the short trailer, make a comment where you answer this question. Should Nazi propaganda films be released from the vault and made available to the German public? Why or why not? So you can answer that question on the flip grid. All right, so those two activities and then coming to class next, uh, next uh, Tuesday, um, you guys should be making some good progress on your leap threes, um, steaming ahead on that. And of course, next, um, Next week, our focus question is this. How is propaganda used to create a sense of us versus them? Right? So that's the, um, that's the topic for tonight. Now, let me just see. Do you guys have any questions before I let you go? Eric? I just want to clarify. Um, so, like, on today's stuff, when there's, like, seven things on, is it due tonight at midnight? Midnight. Okay, because I keep getting emails saying that it's overdue every week. I, 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 I'm telling you, one of the things that is annoying about this path, right, is that it's, um, it, it delivers those emails. I can't find a way to take them off. But midnight is when you really do. So don't be panicked about that. Cool.
thanks for asking that question because I think there are other students who are feeling that same way. Other questions? Okay, so Kelly, Eric, Wayman, thanks for joining us. He's auditing our class and Candace, superb tonight. Thank you for being part of this. I'll see you guys next Tuesday at four o'clock. Okay, we'll give a big wave. See you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>